Good evening. <laughs> or given this, given this evening's subject, maybe it's more appropriate I should say ni hao. <laughs> so welcome to seminars at Steamboat and the second program of our 20th season. And if you're keeping track, this is the 84th seminar in our history. I'm Walt Ebert, I'm the seminar's chair, and it's my pleasure to extend my greetings to those of you who've been with us for those 84 seminars, uh, those of you who may have joined us virtually the last couple of years, and to those of you who are new to, to seminars and have been here tonight or the previous night. For two decades, seminars has presented an impressive number of prescient nonpartisan public policy talks by distinguished experts. And we continue that tradition with this evening's presentation. Now, many people have made this season possible and made it work for all of us. But most importantly, it's you, our audience and our donors, who have kept seminars vibrant as it, and as it passes out of our teen years. You make it possible for us to secure speakers, and you enable us to continue to make it free to the community. Thank you. And please consider donating if you haven't already done so. I had to get that in. <laughs> Special thanks go to tonight's program sponsor, the city of Steamboat Springs, and many thanks as well to tonight's supporting sponsors, Carol and Russ uh, Atha, and Holly and Gary Nelson. <laughs> and if you miss or want to rewatch any seminar, you can view the program with closed captioning by going to our website. And it's about a, a week's delay because of the closed captioning, so this seminar will be available for viewing about a week from today. I also encourage you to share these recordings with friends and colleagues abroad. And I think tonight's seminar is a good example of why we should do that. In addition to sharing with those closer to home. As in previous years, KUNC Community Radio of Northern Colorado is making this season's talks available at their Steamboat Seminars landing page, podcast landing page, at KUNC.org. Once our speaker has concluded his presentation, he will take your questions, which you can submit at any time, and you can do that one of two ways. You can use your phone to scan the QR code on the back of your program, or you can open the browser on your phone or iPad or other device and enter join QA Dot com, and the entry code is 85518. And oh yes, please silence those phones. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Scott Kennedy, and here to introduce him and to moderate the Q&A session is seminar's board member, Gary Nelson. Thank you and shesha. Uh, greetings. Last week, our speaker, Bill Galston, gave us great insights into political divisions within the United States. This week, we turn our view outside of the United States in the competition between China and the United States. And we have the perfect speaker to lead the discussion. Scott Kennedy is a leading expert on China's economy its technological innovation, and its relations with the rest of the world. He has traveled to China many times over the past 34 years, as you'll see, and has published numerous books, uh, reports, and articles on China, including, including recently. So I encourage you to look at Scott Kennedy's, Kennedy's bibliography, and I think you'll find things that you'd be very interested in reading. He is the senior advisor 
and trustee chair in China Business and Economics at, the, at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Previously, he was a professor for 14 years at Indiana University. He has a PhD from George Washington and degrees also from uh, Johns Hopkins and the University of Virginia. I'm looking forward to his thoughts on this vital topic. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm steamboat welcome to Scott Kennedy. Good evening. Or as Walt says, ni hao, uh, or wan shang hao. Um, excuse me while I get my glasses on because I got to that point where suddenly everything feels, looks blurry, whether far away or, or near. Um, I want to thank uh, Walt um, for chairing the seminar series, for Gary, uh, for introducing me, and for uh, working with me the last few months uh, with Debbie, uh, Ken, uh, Tracy, others here. Um, and it's an honor to have this chance to talk with all of you about um, a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, in some ways, this is going to be probably a more personal talk than I usually give. Uh, but uh, I think uh, personal life and uh, professional intersect a lot uh, occasionally, and I thought that would be an appropriate way to begin a conversation with all of you uh, <clears throat> about where U.S.-China uh, relations uh, are, uh, where they've come from, and where they're headed. So I first uh, went to China in 1988, uh, 34 years ago, um, and just by and traveled around the country, uh, visited places, uh, and, and talked to people. Um, and I've continued to do so ever since, uh, whether I was a, a student, uh, and I was a student for a long time trying to avoid a real job. Uh, I was pretty successful in that because I got a job as a professor. Um, and, uh, and then uh, several years ago, threw away my iron rice bowl and moved back to Washington, which is my hometown, uh, to work at CSIS. But still, uh, I love it. So I don't really think of it as, as, as hard work. Uh, but throughout that, uh, meeting people, talking to people has been central to me. And, and of course, I travel a lot. I went back in 2012 uh, with some relatives. And you can see that uh, that grotto has not changed. Uh, I've changed a little <laughs> over the time, uh, but I, I actually ascribe that to malfunctions of cameras making everything look wider. <laughs> so, as you can see, all right. All right. Now, a central part of my work, as I said, is, is meeting people. Uh, and uh, all of my family members were in business, and they can't understand why I decided to be an academic. And, and work in a think tank. Uh, but I became interested in what they did uh, and for and Chinese entrepreneurs and people that do business. And I'm constantly interested in, in how they define success and how they achieve success. And there's no one right way to success other than the fact that they all work incredibly hard. Uh, but whether it's visiting Huawei or Alibaba, which folks have heard about, I'm sure, uh, or going to conferences uh, or making funny faces on the Bund in Shanghai, uh, I've, you know, I think it's really important to travel and uh, that you all are having this in person, to me, is really critical. I am so sick of Zoom, uh, and I hope the rest of you all are too, uh, that we make it so that we don't ever have to be required to use Zoom only if when we want to. Um, I've also traveled with my family to China a lot. Um, first went there uh, with my wife in 1991-92, uh, and then each time I went back to live, we went with one more person. Uh, and uh, we ended up 
is difficult when you go with five people to China because the cabs only hold four. And so we would have one hide behind the tree uh, until we ambushed the cab and said we wouldn't get out. Uh, uh, and then they'd have to take us. Uh, and luckily, one of those individuals is here, uh, my son Ed, who's uh, right down here in front, uh, who has been to China plenty. He hears about China probably more than he ever thought he would or want to. Uh, and he is the one who was with me in the float today. And he is the person who got me up Hans Peak yesterday. So give credit to Ed. I just don't know how you manage to have a mountain that's just a bunch of pile of rocks. It just, and with no path when you get to the top. I'm sure there was, but I didn't have these glasses with me. So in any case, uh, my family's always been part of uh, my China story. Um, and um, over the last 34 years that I've been watching China, the relationship between our two countries has changed dramatically. Uh, when I first started uh, working on China, the uh, relationship uh, was fantastic. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, who campaigned originally uh, in, for the presidency in 1980 as a critic of China and as a fan of Taiwan, ended up changing to as president uh, because the relationship was so important uh, and was the first uh, American president to visit China ever, uh, or since Nixon. Uh, and, so, uh, and so it was being a, a conservative Republican to do that meant a lot. And the relationship actually blossomed, not simply because of their common um, antipathy to the Soviets, uh, but because of a lot of potential ways that we could benefit from having a relationship with each other beyond just that security side. Well, the approach that he took was adopted also by uh, some of his successors, uh, Bill Clinton uh, and George uh, W. Bush. All three of them basically took an approach which was to try to integrate China into the international system to find areas where we could cooperate, to have China participate in international institutions, um, and, and to find a way that despite the fact that we have very different cultures, very different political systems, uh, to find a way to uh, cooperate, uh, and collaborate, solve problems. Um, and that approach is an approach that most American presidents have adopted uh, for much of the past uh, 40 plus years. And so I'm going to do a little academic ease here for, for you because I figure uh, we're going to have something that's like a lecture. I was a professor for a while uh, and I just love charts. <laughs> so, um, and I think this, try, I, this is for me a way to try and summarize uh, so, some of the sort of core ideas that I'm trying to present to you tonight uh, then with a little color of, of photography. Uh, and personal story. So I think about this effort to cooperate with China in, in many areas, uh, sort of divided between two kinds of approaches. One which I just described to you about trying to integrate China into the international system and have it adapt to that system um, as engagement, patient integration, integrating China not just into sort of norms, but the institutions, the actual international institutions that we have, from the WTO to the World Bank to the IMF to the UN, et cetera, and with allies. Now, a slightly different approach that uh, George H.W. Bush took when he was president uh, is what I called management, to manage the relationship. As you remember, uh, when he was president, uh, we had the Tiananmen incident. Uh, in China, uh, where uh, the Chinese uh, slaughtered hundreds if not thousands of people in Beijing and other cities around the country. Uh, and there were sanctions imposed by many, including the United States. Yet President Bush decided that 
the relationship was still important to maintain at some level. Uh, he sent emissaries to try and reassure the Chinese. Uh, and he did not try to see seek to further integrate China or try and change China. He said, if we're going to talk about human rights, we'll do it privately. Uh, and he really just tried to maintain a peaceful coexistence with China. That was really uh, sort of a realpolitik approach that he took. And I think it differs from uh, his predecessor, President Reagan, and, and uh, presidents that came after him, all the way up through President Obama. Well, uh, things uh, did not stay the same in the relationship. Um, and I think a, a big reason, a big change agent uh, causing uh, a, a downgrade in, in our ties is the rise of Xi Jinping as, as China's leader. Uh, Xi Jinping has now been uh, China's leader for almost a decade. Uh, he uh, first became head of the Communist Party as general secretary in, 19, in, in 2012, uh, and then head of the government as president in early 2013. And Xi Jinping's not your typical Chinese leader. He's quite different. Um, he um, comes from a family which actually his dad was a reformist during uh, the Mao era. Uh, but Xi Jinping uh, really thought one of his key goals just sort of individually is the protection of the party. He uh, feels a personal connection back through his dad to the party and wants to protect the Communist Party's hold on power. And when he was being chosen in, in the late 2000s uh, to be China's next leader uh, after Hu Jintao uh, stepped down, uh, China then was facing a lot of, uh, its economy was hurting, it was corruption, uh, there were lots of protests from workers and others. Uh, it had uh, this nascent civil society which was quite uppity, had journalists which were writing stories uncovering corruption, uh, Chinese foreign policy uh, was facing a lot of difficulties with the United States, with the Middle East, uh, with Russia. Um, and he had two choices. Uh, some, like me, or other Westerners, uh, liberals, uh, suggested, well, why don't you have, really have real rule of law in China? Why don't you really patch things up with the United States? Why don't you get your economy in order? Uh, strengthen civil society, journalists, lawyers, etc. And, and then you'll be on a more stable path to being a successful modern country. Uh, well, Xi Jinping uh, totally turned down that advice. Uh, he did the exact opposite. Uh, in, in, instead of uh, listening to Thomas Jefferson, the founder of the university that I went to, University of Virginia, as an undergrad, uh, he, he listened to Vladimir Lenin uh, and decided to centralize and really bring, put Leninism back in Marxism-Leninism. So he uh, stomped out civil society in China, quashed lawyers, journalists, ph philanthropic organizations, um, and for, in terms of foreign policy, uh, had much more assertive foreign policy, much more concerned about the US's motives. Uh, this was encouraged partly by the Snowden affair, uh, in which the, everyone realized we were spying on them, and I'm surprised that they were surprised. <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, they realized, I guess we were doing a pretty good job. Um, but as, as a result of that, and of a variety of factors, he's moved the country in a much more left direction. Um, and every time the U.S. has put out an olive branch to try and stabilize the relationship, uh, he's, he's turned it away. Um, and... Uh, really, all the way up until uh, today, and, and what he's done in 2022 with China's approach to COVID, you can really see that China is moving in a very different direction. Uh, the era of reform and opening in China that Deng Xiaoping launched in the late 70s is now over. They're in a very, moving in a very different direction, uh, and that uh, means that they're challenging the international order that was built since World War II. Um, and as a result, the United States has also responded to this change uh, in China. And so the, the first president really to do that was, was Donald Trump. Uh, whether you like Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, he was the first one really to sound the alarm that China was moving in a direction that was significantly 
challenging us. Um, and uh, he pushed back really hard in only a way that he could. Donald Trump obviously had no commitment to global international institutions, multilateralism, allies, uh, and he has one typical uh, negotiating style. Massive pressure uh, against the other, uh, no stepping back, no looking for conciliation until the other side yells uncle. That's, that's his approach. The Chinese were caught off guard because they never met a leader that tried that. Uh, in fact, that's not very different from oftentimes from China's negotiating style. Uh, and in fact, Chinese that I met said, oh, you know what, we recognize this. It's very un-American of you, but uh, we will uh, we'll have to deal with him. Uh, and so um, Donald Trump's approach was, let's make the Chinese, let's squeeze the Chinese until they yell uncle. And so we had our sort of crazy uncle strategy, which was he will do anything, even hurt our own self-interest to make them concede. And so he put an amazing amount of pressure on the Chinese. And so instead of seeking cooperation with China, uh, his approach was much more uh, toward the direction of conflict and actually not very different from George H.W. Bush in that he wasn't really interested in international institutions, much more of a, a realist approach, uh, unilateral pressure, not about the UN or allies and, and things like that. And just... Um, unbelievable amount of pressure. And, and as you may remember, uh, the president essentially said that China had eaten our lunch for several decades, taken advantage of us. It's the reason why the US lost 8 million manufacturing jobs, is why, uh, and that we're basically suckers in this relationship. And that the smaller the relationship, the better. Uh, and that relationship basically is a list of risks, which he decided you know, we needed to uh, reduce. And so he took this very distinctive approach, quite different from his predecessors. So President Biden, um, you know, campaigned saying, you know, absolutely nothing nice about uh, Donald Trump's presidency, domestic policy or foreign policy, uh, and that he had made a lot of mistakes on, on China. Um, and so um, he came in with a plan to, to change foreign policy quite dramatically. And uh, in many ways, he did. Uh, certainly, the US is uh, strengthened uh, focus on allies, uh, multilateralism, international institutions. Uh, he's talked a lot about investing at home uh, and, and many other elements of, of, of foreign policy and you know, focusing on democracy. Um, but the concern about China has not changed. The concern about China has not changed at all. Uh, the uh, president himself, uh, his secretary of state, national security advisor, uh, the team around him are as worried about China as uh, the previous administration. In fact, maybe more because this is a more ideological administration that has a genuine commitment and view that democracy, free markets, the right type of political system and economic system, uh, and they need to be protected and they're under threat. Uh, and so that sets up a, actually a more ideological conflict uh, between the US and China because they come at things domestically differently uh, than uh, President Trump did. So I describe this new approach as being in some ways similar to the way President Trump pursued things uh, in terms of really seeing this relationship as a conflictual one, yet their approach, their strategy is quite different. As the Secretary of State uh, in May outlined in his speech on China policy, uh, their approach is, uh, has three pillars. Uh, first of all, to uh, invest in the United States, uh, strengthen America's economy, its high tech, uh, its institutions, align, align with allies uh, so that we don't isolate ourselves, uh, and compete, create appropriate defenses 
it, whether it's export controls, investment restrictions, uh, protecting our IP, uh, other types of defenses uh, to make sure uh, that we uh, don't just simply hand over something willy-nilly to our uh, competitors. Um, so this approach, again, it's, it, it's got a more ideological basis to it than the way uh, the previous administration did. Uh, and in their view, the, this means that what we're seeing is not competition between two countries just duking it out for who can have more power and influence internationally, but whose system, whose system is going to reign supreme? Is it going to be a Chinese system that advocates, you know, uh, state capitalist authoritarian norms and values, or is it going to be uh, one that emphasizes free, mar free market democracies? And so you hear the administration from the president on down emphasizing those uh, two uh, differences, that that's what this is about. This is not about just the U.S. and China, two uh, countries. One thing that you don't hear much about, uh, and I think it's a challenge for the administration, is about cooperation. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the float today, but gosh, it was hot. Uh, and as someone told me outside, do you believe in climate change? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, we're not going to solve it unless we figure out how to work with other countries. We have a global pandemic where you need to work with other countries, including China, on all of these things. And the administration doesn't really have a space. It has a footnote about cooperation. But in its general framework, uh, it has prioritized the competition of these two systems over addressing those larger challenges. So this is where I've been the last two and a half years, in my basement. Ed knows, because Ed was just above me in his room uh, online uh, taking courses. And uh, as you can see, there's a Zoom screen open there. Uh, and uh, I did that a lot. Uh, and you can do it a lot when you're a China expert, because everyone is, when you get up at 6 AM, you can still have meetings with folks in China, and when you go to sleep, those folks are up again. Dang it. So you can, you, all day long, 24-7, I was Zooming. Um, hence, tired of it. Um, and so no travel, obviously. I mean, I, I went to 7-Eleven was an exciting time for me. Um, but it's had a, had a, it's had a, a profound effect um, on US-China relations. The interest in China as a result of the downturn in relations is higher than ever, right? Unbelievable level of interest. At CSAS, we, when I started, we had three people that worked on China full time. Now we've got 10 uh, and 290 other people who are part-time China experts uh, commenting. Um, everyone has an opinion about China and obviously you know in Washington DC, you don't need any facts to have an opinion, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so there's a lot of talk and chatter about China now, more than ever, but our understanding is almost at an all-time low because we are learning about China by reading the People's Daily and China Daily and C watching CCTV and official speeches and whatever our intelligence community can pick up, you know, uh, by uh, uh, listening, um, which is not enough. It's not enough. You cannot know enough unless you talk to people on the ground to hear what the range of opinions are, not just the official policy that's been announced, so that you can understand why a policy was chosen over the others, um, what they understand is what our policy is, what our choices were. Um, we don't understand any of that right now on either side because we are not traveling. Um, that is a monster, monster problem. And as a result of that, Washington is now an echo chamber uh, where uh, someone says something and it just gets repeated again and again. There's no new info into that system to change the dynamic. And I'm not saying that this is a problem just because relations are bad and I'm some kind of crazy panda hugger that would think that if we just travel, we'll if re fall in love with China again. I just think even if you're trying to even if you think China's genu you're correct that China is a big giant problem and we need to compete with them, we ought to be as smart as we possibly can about what's going on 
and how can we best, uh, most smartly, uh, implement policy? And the same thing for the Chinese. I bet you, actually, their echo chamber is worse than ours, right? Because they already have controlled media and everything else, controlled educational system, ideological rigidity in the Communist Party. And Xi Jinping is super duper strong, way stronger than Joe Biden is, right? Joe Biden can barely get anything done. Uh, very different than Xi Jinping. People are very scared to tell Xi Jinping the truth. Uh, and if no information's coming in, it just gets worse and worse. So we really are now just watching these two trains slowly moving down the tracks toward each other. And I think travel uh, and talking to each other is important about really trying to figure out how we can manage uh, this relationship, even if we're not going to solve it fundamentally. So uh, I came up with a plan hatched with this gentleman, Wang Ji Su, who's a uh, professor at Peking University. Uh, China's, he's China's leading America watcher. Uh, so you should go read stuff by Wang Ji Su. He's written in Foreign Affairs several times. Uh, I interviewed him in February. You can go online and watch our program. Uh, and so we, 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 we hatched a plot. We were to take each other hostage. Uh, as you know, there were two Canadians recently who were taken hostage. Uh, uh, Michael Kovrig, Michael Spavor by the Chinese after the U.S. arrested, after the Canadians arrested Meng Wanzhou of Huawei uh, in, as part of an American request to try and extradite her to the United States. Actually, Michael Kovrig, one of them is a friend of mine, uh, and so he, you know, he spent over a thousand days uh, in confinement in China. So uh, Jisa and I joke, what we're going to do is take each other hostage. As what we're going to do is work together to, to demonstrate how important in-person field research and discussion is. And so, um, luckily, uh, he, he said he'd go first. Uh, so, uh, he came to the ICE in early February uh, with, a, with a junior colleague. Uh, I set up um, over 50 meetings for them in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then they went to New York. Uh, and Boston and met others. Um, they were like a glass of water in a steamboat spring sun, uh, in a desert sun. They, everyone in Washington wanted to talk to them because otherwise they're just reading the news uh, and not learning. He was extremely helpful. He did, he did real, real valuable work during his trip. Uh, he then went home and on his trip home, uh, out of the benefit of visiting us is he got 44 days quarantine in China. Well, three in Dallas first, before, but then in Shanghai, Chongqing, and Beijing. And in fact, uh, when he got back to uh, Beijing, just like many, he sealed his door and said, we'll see you in two weeks. So serious quarantining. You think we've like been serious uh, on this? A, a, a different level, different level. So in any case, uh, it was my turn uh, to go, um, and I was supposed to go in April. So I, I, went, to, I went to San Francisco to wait, uh, got to do a bunch of tests. The, the rules to get into China ain't easy, right? You get, uh, it's difficult to get a visa. You've got to do a bunch of tests here. You've got to uh, quarantine. At that point, it was three weeks uh, when you arrive at a minimum. Um, and anyway, I, I got to San Francisco waiting for my flight to Shanghai, and this happened. So everyone knows about the lockdown in Shanghai. Uh, the, so it's not the fact that they had a lot of cases, it's just they, they locked down the city uh, dramatically. And I'm, I don't even think I need to explain to all of you watching, who must have watched the news, uh, about the draconian response that they had. Uh, so I could have gotten on the plane, uh, and if I had, I would have gotten to sit in a hotel for six weeks. A, fr a friend of mine who went just before me got the six weeks in a hotel in Shanghai, turned around and went back to his home in Salt Lake. So I decided not to do that. Very, very tough decision. Had the ticket, not inexpensive, 9,000 bucks to sit in the back of the bus, which is what United is, right? And um, uh, if you own stock in United, was sorry. In any case, and, and I, but I'm loyal, so I'm loyal, right? I'm addicted to mileage plus, so. In any case, I, I decided I did not want to come home. I had already said goodbye to Ed. Ed did not expect to see me for two months, and he was ready to party. So, uh, and my wife was, had been with me for two and a half years, and she decided 
I needed a break. So I didn't want to go home. Uh, I wanted to do something else. So, so I decided to do something else. Uh, I decided to go to uh, three other countries instead. Instead, on the same day my flight to left for Shanghai, I took a different flight to Taipei. Uh, and I got to do uh, plenty of testing there. And I got 10-day quarantine uh, in this nice hotel room uh, and wonderful food, three meals a day. Um, luckily, they had Uber Eats. Uh, and uh, I, could, I was looking out at a large mountain, uh, which, which helped me. And as you can see, just before uh, I went on the trip, I, I ran a marathon. Uh, first one, Ed did the half marathon, uh, again, to help me. In any case, I tried running in that room, from that door to there, <laughs> back and forth. That's, that's not a productive run. I, I, I don't encourage anyone to do that. So, in any case, uh, so I was in Taipei for 22 days, and I, that's Taipei 101, was you know, one of the tallest buildings in Asia. Um, I visited uh, a bunch of companies, including TSMC, which is the world's leading chip manufacturer. Um, I visited Chen Jianren, former vice president, uh, who had uh, helped stamp out SARS 2003 and 2004. I visited 30 plus people, in, in 10 days, uh, when, once I got out of quarantine. Uh, I went to Seoul uh, and uh, spent five days there uh, talking to uh, businesses, government officials, uh, experts. Uh, and then I went to Tokyo uh, and I spent uh, eight days there uh, meeting people uh, in government, uh, in business. It was, I gotta tell you, no, no easy traveling. You need a visa for all these places now, which you used to not need as an American. Uh, so uh, no tourists traveling. Uh, airports in Asia still to this day empty. I was using in Denver. It's, it's like unbelievable. Uh, but in, in Asia, it's empty. Um, and so it's just really, really uh, dramatic. Um, uh, and just uh, the difficulties of going through quarantine and everything, um, and, and challenges that I can t tell you more about. Um, but let me tell you the four takeaways that I have from this trip, from going to these uh, three places, um, and, then, and then wind things up and tell you uh, a little bit about what's next and then have a conversation with you. So first of all, I went to three amazingly well-run countries. Uh, whether or not we have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, we'll leave that. I'm a individual. I can't recognize a country or deny them recognition. We'll just talk about it like a, 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 like a country. Taiwan's well run. South Korea's well run. Japan's well run. Gap between uh, so highly capable governments, relatively low gap between rich and poor, all handled the pandemic extremely well. Very small number of deaths. Um, and they, real, they basically had uh, very strict policies uh, it, right up until February uh, when Omicron came along and they decided they couldn't keep it locked in. Uh, they told people to be smart, uh, but uh, cases went up in every place, first in Japan and Korea and then uh, in Taiwan. The first day I got to Taiwan, 1,000 cases. The day I left, 46,000 cases. Went up to 90, I think it's down, down to about 30 a day. So they've all had that curve. They've all gotten to the other side. Of, of the pandemic, high, high levels of vaccination, et cetera. Extremely well run countries, and that's, that's very, very important uh, because it gives them a sense of self-confidence. They, they aren't massively opposed to globalization. They aren't massively afraid of China. They aren't massively fighting with each other and fragmented internally because of, of their high capacity. Uh, and that is critically important, uh, and I totally didn't expect that when I went on my trip. And every time I go on a trip, my goal is to be surprised. And that was the biggest surprise. Um, so as a result of that, uh, high capacity and, and self-confidence, uh, their view of China is very different than ours. Our view of China uh, is, is that it's 10 meters high, that it's left, leaving us in the dust, uh, that if we don't uh, stop it, it will uh, 
overthrow the current international order. And so it's all about defense. It's all about sticks. And China's neighbors, uh, our closest friends and allies, uh, have a different view. In their view, uh, you can engage with China, interact with China, coexist with China, and defend against China, and compete with it. So it's not engagement or competition or engagement or decoupling. It is engage and compete, or more cor correctly, engage to compete. They all have vulnerabilities and dependencies on China. But what I heard again and again is China's got dependencies and vulnerabilities from us, from the relationship with us. And we're going to maximize those as much as we possibly can to remind them that we are technological leaders, that we have things that they don't have and that they need us. And that is a very, you're not hearing that conversation in Washington, D.C. And, not or. Washington, D.C. has a very difficult time grappling with globalization and how to interact with China on, econ on the economic front. Uh, very clear foreign policy on security realm from the Biden administration, but on economics, they basically are playing political defense. They don't want to get attacked by the Republicans or by the most progressive Democrats. And so instead of doing what President Biden really wanted to do, which was to rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership and participate in the multilateral order, they came up with this half measure of a half measure called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which they rolled out when the president was in uh, Asia for his May visit. He went to South Korea first and then Japan. When he was in Japan, he un un uh, uh, they announced the founding of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Had 14 countries as members, but it's really nowhere close to as important as the, as the Trans-Pacific Partnership could be. Uh, it's really about setting standards on, on important things, but pretty narrow. But the president doesn't want to get attacked politically, and so he's come up with the smallest proposal possible to keep the U.S. in the game. And our friends in the region basically said, this really isn't going to fly, but we'll support him, the president, because it's the United States. But they are very skeptical that IPEF is going to succeed. So they've been going, back, going to Washington for negotiations, but is it really going to translate into something they, they really have no idea? So we've got to do a lot more. Last thing, uh, supply chains, uh, supply chain resilience. You've probably heard a lot about supply chain resilience uh, the past year and a half, um, partly from semiconductors and cars, but from lots of different things. And when I was in Asia, I heard lots about supply chain resilience. Uh, in fact, I went to an event co-hosted by the US government and the Taiwanese about supply chain resilience and semiconductors. And I sat there watching two groups of people talk past each other, which if you've ever gone to a government meet meeting, totally not shocking, or if you come to my family's house sometimes. <laughs> so as a result of, so what are they saying? So the American, uh, so the view in Taiwan about supply chain resilience and semiconductors, you know they produce most of the world, they fabricate most of the semiconductors that are designed elsewhere, but they are fabricated in plants in Taiwan, mainly by TSMC. So their view is, let's uh, expand the number of facilities in Taiwan in different parts of the island that produce semiconductors. Let's make sure we've got enough talent and electrical engineers and technicians coming out of our universities. Let's have enough electricity, enough water, enough materials to strengthen the production of chips here. The American definition of semiconductor resilience is move all of those factories here. Uh, Arizona is the first place they've got a new factory from TSMC, but they're looking uh, elsewhere. We can't have a conversation like that uh, and get very far because they want to solidify production there. We want it all moved here. Eventually, something's going to have to give. We're going to have to figure out how to collaborate with each other in solving that puzzle. So the biggest final takeaway, all of that stuff together, is that the U.S. has a lot to learn from its allies. If we don't figure out how to listen to them, and cooperate with them, we will end up isolating ourselves. Uh, and that's not what we want. 
the U.S. has an important leadership role to play in the world, uh, and our allies can teach us a lot. And I learned a lot on this trip. So uh, what do I do next? What do we do next? So I got another plane ticket. Um, so I'm ready to fly again. We've got big problems with China economically. Both of our economies are not doing well. Uh, we're ready to potentially uh, remove some tariffs on China, but potentially start a new investigation, which would result in raising tariffs again. We've got uh, this war in Ukraine, uh, which has got everyone worried that Taiwan might be next. And when I was in Taiwan, there's a certain level of anxiety there. Uh, Xi Jinping is coming up for a third term reappointment uh, this fall. Uh, and if, if he were running for re-election, like if, there was a, if it was a democracy, their economy is so bad, COVID's been such a problem, he couldn't get re-elected. But that's not the system. So he's going to sail through, uh, and we're going to still face this person for quite some time. So we'll see what happens. I'll get on a plane. Hopefully, I will still be the first think tanker from D.C. and China in almost three years. And we'll see what talking does. Thank you very much. I encourage you to uh, submit questions. We have uh, the QR code or the, or the website at uh, joinqa.com. We have a few. Uh, Drilling down, talking more about China and some of its contra contradictions. It's, uh, it's a country that's known for its billionaires with wealth generated from private companies, yet it has many state-owned enterprises. How do these, how do these two things uh, coexist? Gary, that's a, a great question, great place to start. And... Um... You can, uh, China is full of contradictions. Member Mao Zedong wrote an essay called uh, On the Ten Contradictions. Uh, Jiang Zemin, who I showed you in a picture, uh, wrote an essay called On the Twelve Contradictions. You always have to copy your master. Um, in any case, uh, China is, is full of them. Yes, it has tried to transition to a market economy, yet it's got more state planning than anyone. It's got... Um, not just billionaires, but millions of private companies, but it's decided to, to protect the state sector, um, uh, to provide stability to the economy, um, and to provide public goods. State-owned companies really don't focus on making a profit. They keep people employed. They do public works. They provide, they engage in, in uh, industries that are important for national defense for China. China is the world's largest carbon emitter, but it's the world's number one producer of electric vehicles and solar panels and wind turbines. Uh, China puts the most number of people in prison each year for corruption, yet it's still the most of a highly corrupt uh, political system. So it ha has uh, all of these contradictions uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, the Communist Party is not looking to become a free market democracy. They are trying to keep the Communist Party in power. Uh, and so that is about trying to make the economy grow, but not let private entrepreneurs run amok. Uh, that's why in 20, late 2019, um, in October of 2019, when their most famous billionaire, Jack Ma, uh, who founded Alibaba, gave a speech in Shanghai, which I, I showed, uh, he gave kind of a harsh speech but I've heard that speech many times by Chinese uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, but he, uh, uh, Xi Jinping decided to make an example of him, to let private companies know who's boss, remind them that it doesn't matter how much money you make, at the end of the day, the party controls everything. Uh, in fact, that slogan, that, that phrase is a central piece, centerpiece to the, Chinese, to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, is, uh, so that is still, and so you have, that's why you have these kinds of contradictions. There's no way Xi Jinping 
is going to let that country evolve into something that approximates anything like any type of Western market democracy. Um, and since they're big uh, and they control their financial system, uh, they haven't faced a crisis, a, a financial crisis yet, big enough to force them to change. The, uh, we'll have questions on um, health in Taiwan in a second, but uh, I know you've written a lot about uh, China's uh, aid to its own industry, which really affects the global trade market and their relations with the U.S. And uh, how would you describe that? And sure, sure. Well, um, lots of countries practice what we call industrial policy right, where states uh, provide support for infant industries or industries that are uh, at the end of their longevity, like the you know, steel industry or others that have run into problems uh, or that have political connections. Um, uh, China's uh, has industrial, industrial policy on steroids. Now, we've, uh, the WTO has rules about subsidies. The World Trade Organization says countries can only can't spend uh, uh, use subsidies if it affects your trading relationship. You know, if it distorts trade, it also says you're supposed to report your subsidies. Um, well, the Chinese don't report their subsidies, and their subsidies apply to lots of things that affect trade. And even when they don't affect trade, because China's economy is so large, if you if you provide subsidies to an electric vehicle market the size of China's, is going to affect the global market. Um, and so. Uh, we decided at CSIS to do some math on this because the Chinese would say, well, you, uh, you're criticizing us for subsidizing electric vehicles, but you have Buy America. You have other programs. So we went and we, we for the first time, totaled up all of Chinese industrial policy spending, uh, which we were very conservative in our math, came up to 2% of Chinese GDP. It's about 300 billion U.S. dollars, thereabouts, larger than China's total defense budget. We, ours, we did out, we also calculated America's and, and six other countries, and our, ours is about 0.4% of GDP. Uh, and in fact, if you modify, if you do the math on China a little bit more realistically, you get closer to 5% for them. So they are a total outlier. Um, and so it's a, it's a big challenge. Now, one response could be, well, geez, electric vehicles are really important to addressing global warming so, and climate change, so therefore, you know, it may not be good for Ford or GM, but it may be good for the world, and you just live with it. But I don't think most people think that way, that there needs to be some types of constraints and disciplines around industrial policy and subsidies, and we've got to get to it. I think one of the things that I'm worried about is Washington, D.C. thinks that there's a subsidies deficit. That in fact, we need to catch up. We need to get from 0.4 to 1.8 or whatever, that, or 5, and spend through the nose on industrial policy would be a monster mistake. Because as you uh, suggested in your first question, actually, most of China's true success is not through the state-owned sector, but through very competitive private companies. In fact, the less industrial policy, the more success that they've had. So if we look at Chinese industrial policy and think we got to catch up, that would just be a, ro a road to another financial crisis on our part. So we need to learn the right lessons from what the Chinese are doing, not the wrong lessons. Uh China's own population, and uh, uh, are there, are there, is the health of the Chinese population a liability for them? Is that, it's, you know, it's, we're not, it's, there's not a lot of transparency there, but you may have some insights into that. Um, the problems with lung cancer and carcinogens and adequate treatment. Yeah. Um, I think. China's population, in many ways, has been a big asset, right? You've got um, a, they had a big population explosion in the 50s and 60s, after the end of World War II and the end of the Korean War. Um, most of those folks became of working age in the late 70s, 80s, um, and was central to China's rapid economic growth, uh, that population explosion. Of course, at the same time, in the late 70s, they also decided, whoa, we've got too many people. We've, we're, our population is growing too quickly. So they implemented the one-child poli one policy, mm -hmm. um, which had lots of negative side effects. Of course, in the way it was implemented, 
right? Um, uh, and but the and but it did for a while. It made made reducing popul limiting population growth makes sense at some point. Um, it would have occurred naturally because the better educated your workforce is, the more women that are in the workforce and the more they're educated, population growth naturally declines everywhere. You don't have to have a one China policy to get that. It's just a scientific fact. It's never mm -hmm. been violated by anybody. So they could have basically got there. But in any case, because they implemented the one, China, the one child policy, um, what you've seen is a very rapid graying of the population. And uh, because of a preference for boys over girls, um, having uh, way too many boys to girls, that, ratio, that gender ratio uh, really mm -hmm. out of whack. Um, as a result of those two things, uh, you now have a race between will China get rich before it gets old? Uh, that's the first one. And the second is will they have uh, a revolution before they stabilize because you've got a lot of unmarried men. Uh, the best thing in my life was uh, getting married. Uh, took me off the streets. <laughs> uh, and probably to many people in here uh, as, as well. And, and so, but yeah, you get, you get a, 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 in, in societies where you have that gender imbalance uh, you end up with a lot more crime and problems. And so China has both of those, those difficulties. They do have a tremendously well-educated workforce in, in cities, in uh, urban areas, uh, who have worked in uh, these factories uh, and companies and are innovators uh, and, and, and uh, genuinely formidable. But you still have a, a very large population of people that are insufficiently educated you know, half of China's population is still rural, and two-thirds of rural Chinese don't finish high school. So you still have a, so even though you, again, this gets to the contradictions questions, you've got some of the most smartest people, successful companies, but you also have this long tail of uh, less educated people uh, and a graying population. So we worry about China, and we should worry about China, but it, it has its problems, uh, and its population is one of them. In terms of health, which is what you're originally asking about, yeah, China has a health profile that looks like a country that's much wealthier. You know, uh, uh, smoking is still quite popular there relative to here. It's amazing you go into a restaurant and people are smoking. Uh, women smoke there much more than here. Um, and of course, their diet has changed dramatically. Uh, and so you see, you see all the consequences of those things uh, affecting it. Uh, and so um, that's, those are big challenges on top of it. China spends only something like 6% of its GDP on healthcare. We spend 17. I don't think they should catch up again on 17%, but they could spend a lot more, uh, especially on preventative care, uh, and they'd have a healthier society. So I think between demography, gender imbalance, um, uh, and their health profile, they have, a, they have a, 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 an education, they have a significant uh, human capital challenge that they need to address mm -hmm. uh, that um, is, is significant on top of everything else that they've got to, to deal with. Um, we have a number of questions that uh, came, from the, came from the audience on Taiwan particularly in the context of Ukraine. And uh, you've had the benefit of meeting with people in Taipei and Taiwan, and uh, how do they see it, and how do you assess the risks, or how would you put it in context? Yeah. Um, you know, if there's a, uh, a chance for a war between the U.S. and China, um, a Taiwan scenario is the most likely of those potential scenarios that you could come up with. Um, and certainly, as a result of what's, a, a, well, I guess for a few things. One is Xi Jinping has suggested he wants, while he's leader of China, to solve this problem. So how long does that mean? We don't know, and what does solution mean? You know, what they say is they would like peaceful unification with 
Taiwan, uh, but they won't put aside the possibility of using force. Uh, they've tried to lure Taiwan with tons of economic opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, and there have been a lot. The TSMC is only the world's most successful fab because, in, in large part, because of its relationship with China, that it fabricates chips that then are sent to China and then put in your phone and your laptop and your iPad et cetera, it, that's part of that supply chain. 42% of Taiwan's exports go to China, have a million Taiwanese living in China, uh, including very close uh, friends of mine uh, who I've known for all of this time that I've been working on Taiwan. Because when I went to study in China, I went to Taiwan next and met friends there. Um, so the, I don't think that we ought to assume that China's first preference is to launch a military attack. They know that would be putting everything up for grabs. Um, and it would be. US, you, whatever US declaratory policy is, US real policy is, we're going to come to Taiwan's defense. Um, so um, it's, so we're, we are on opposite sides of this. Uh, Ukraine has made this, uh, brought this home because uh, the US and Europe has uh, stood up a little bit belatedly for Ukraine, but stood up nevertheless and pushed back against this a clear violation of Ukraine's sovereignty uh, from a leader, uh, essentially authoritarian, who said, this place actually belongs to our country. Mm -hmm. he doesn't, uh, Putin doesn't think Ukraine is a legitimate country. So you can see parallels. Um, on the other hand, uh, I'm, I'm not so worried that we're going to just run into war Right, you know, very soon, imminently, with the Taiwan, with with China over Taiwan. Uh, it's not a land border. If you, in case you didn't notice, <laughs> there's a little bit of water in between. The Chinese don't have experience fighting wars. For they haven't fought really since a border war with the, the Soviets in 1969, which is not really much of a war. They've had a couple skirmishes with the Indians, very small scale. They do have a large military, but it's an untested military. Uh, in addition, uh, I think we've made, we've, we've made it very clear that our commitment to Taiwan is a lot higher than our commitment to Ukraine uh, and that the consequences would be quite high. The Japanese have spoken up. Uh, uh, former Prime Minister Abe, who unfortunately was recently assassinated, really helped turn Japanese foreign policy to be much more assertive. Uh, and uh, Japan and Taiwan have, have a very close unofficial relationship. Um, and you see the same uh, with others. You even see NATO starting to think about putting Taiwan on their agenda. So I'm, I'm concerned about Taiwan, but I think uh, we've said very clearly what, what our position is, and I, th I think deterrence is going to work. The question is, can we actually provide some kinds of a balance between deterrence and reassurance to keep this uh, you know, triangular relationship from... Uh, cascading into war. I think if I was looking for real risks, um, one would be that in 2024, Taiwan will have its next presidential election. Uh, its current president, Tsai Ing-wen, has done a, a fabulous job uh, since she took over in 2016, as I described in the beginning of my, in the middle of my talk about how Taiwan is so well run. Um, she can only serve two terms, so she's gonna, she's gonna step down. Uh, her uh, either of her two likely successors, one from her same party, the Democratic Progressive Party, or from the opposition party, the KMT, which, remember, came over from China originally, uh, they're both untested. And her party's likely successor, Lai Qingde, who's currently the premier, is a, uh, a staunch independence advocate. So if he were to say the same kinds of things as president that he said, throughout his career, that would probably push the Chinese over the edge to, to fight a war. So the question is, can we educate him, make him responsible enough so that he's a more careful, uh, prudent leader if he were to be elected? So to me, I'm watching what happens in that election campaign in Taiwan in, in early, late 2023, election January of 2024, uh, take office Jan May of 2024. So variety of, uh, so that's, that's the, to me, the biggest variable uh, with regard to Taiwan. Oh, so we're almost, okay. Just getting my directions. No worries, the, uh, no worries, no worries. 
the, uh, Hong Kong is a different situation, isn't it? <laughs> Hong Kong's a disaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I first went to Hong Kong in 1990, uh, and uh, so going there for almost as long as been going to China, and uh, really fond of Hong Kong. Um, and um, the one country, two systems formula that the Chinese promised, remember when Deng Xiaoping and Margaret Thatcher met and signed the joint declaration in uh, 1984, the Chinese said, you know what, we'll leave Hong Kong system in place for 50 years, untouched. They can have its capitalist system, we'll have our socialist system. We won't send the PLA into Hong Kong. Um, whatever whatever uh, we inherit, we'll leave that for 50 years. Um, we didn't get that. We didn't get that. And that's, that's a consequence of Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. uh, previous Chinese communist leaders we're willing to make the compromise between letting Hong Kong practice its system and the Communist Party maintaining authority n nationally, because in their mind it was a, it was a, Hong Kong was so important economically as a middle ground between the East and West, between China and the rest of the world, and they knew that Hong Kong's rule of law, its financial system, its free tariff system, its educational system was extremely important. Uh, and so they were willing to put up with an uppity Hong Kong. Um, and I remember going to Hong Kong uh, so many times, and the pl place I would go, being a professor, you know, uh, would be a bookstore. Uh, and I would just, you know, and if you look at the books uh, on Chinese politics, this was the best rumor mill place in the world. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, you know, these great stories about Chinese leaders, the corruption, all of the other dirt that you would want, uh, rumor after rumor, and, and some actually reasonably written stuff too. So, um, and you could find that in, in bookstores. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, um, when they close up these bookstores, then I know Hong Kong's changed, right? Um, so, Xi Jin, a Xi Jinping-led China is just incompatible with the one country, two systems formula. And so um, as protests, as they were approaching 2017 where they were supposed to allow direct elections for their chief executive, uh, he was determined not to let that happen. Uh, and so there were, as there were protests, he cracked down on them. And then in 2020, uh, he imposed the national security law uh, and that was lights out on one country, two systems. And we've just seen the gradual erosion of that since, mm. and we've seen the gradual uh, fleeing of Hong Kong by expats. Uh, it's a totally different place. It's not that middle ground anymore. China doesn't want it to be the middle ground. So um, the US and others have imposed penalties, uh, sanctions uh, uh, on Chinese because of Hong Kong. You know, uh, for me, it's, you know, their country, they want to they destroy a city, Good luck to them. We can change our policies on Hong Kong. We don't have to treat Hong Kong like it's a separate country. It's a separate member of the WTO, uh, International Olympic Committee, et cetera. If you want to treat it like it's Shanghai or Wuhan or Tianjin or Beijing, okay. Maybe it doesn't need to be in international institutions. So I think we, have, we still aren't at the end of the conversation about how we are going to interact with Hong Kong. Uh, and the rest of the world's gonna interact with Hong Kong. I don't think it's gonna make a bit of difference while Xi Jinping is leader mm -hmm. uh, until he gets hit by an electric bus or has a heart attack mm -hmm. or something else. We're, we're stuck with this. Uh, but I think we can, we can change how we act. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately quite gloomy about Hong Kong. Well, thank you very much. We've had, we have a long more, a lot more questions and it's a huge topic and thank you very much for for your talk, Scott.